By the 1st of October, the aspens are done showing off for the year. First dusting of snow on the peaks, then first dusting of snow on the pasture. The color is almost gone and with it, the tourists. My neighbors from the Sour Ranch have moved into town for the winter. For the next seven months, I'll be the last occupied house on my road. The horses hang around the corral looking a little grim. They know what's coming. I'm just back from a 14-day research trip to the Eastern Canadian Arctic on an icebreaker and three separate weeks teaching on the island of Ile de Ré off the Atlantic coast of France on a 140-year-old schooner out of Rockport, Maine and at the Omega Institute in the beautiful Hudson Valley. I have two weeks at the ranch before I have to leave again. I've all but missed this year's color change in the high country, so even though there's much to be done to prepare for winter, this morning Fenton, William, and I take a hike up to Phoenix Park, one of the most wind-protected places in the valley, hoping to find a few groves of aspens still holding their leaves. We climb for an hour in light drizzle, and under my boot soles is a carpet of green and gold. We surprise a mule deer buck, a four-pointer, at the place where the forest gives way to meadow. When we reach the waterfall at the top of the park, the sun peeks through the clouds just long enough to turn the whole scene Kodachrome. The heavy gunmetal sky, the ghost aspens with only a fraction of their leaves left glowing like a fluorescent pencil sketch beneath it, the water tumbling down the face of the cliff, beads of it lit up against the dark rock and spinning earthward like fireflies. In the summertime, this trail sees a fair amount of use from hikers and horsemen, sometimes four-wheelers, and even the occasional four-by-four -four truck. But summer feels long over and we are between hunting seasons, so the dogs and I have the place to ourselves. Years ago, on an August hike right at the tail end of the monsoon, I got caught in a thunderstorm halfway across the big meadow that leads to Phoenix Park. I was new to the valley and had not yet learned how a bright white micropuff in one corner of the sky can morph into a cumulonimbic monster in the amount of time it takes to go around a couple of bends in the trail. If you've never gotten caught in a thunderstorm at high altitude, if you've never felt your long straight hair stand on end as if someone above you has strings attached to it, if you've never smelled sulfur in the air just before a crack you can feel at the center of your rib cage splits the sky in two, if you have never run between lightning bolts that are hitting the ground on every side of you, your brain racing to determine whether you will improve or diminish your odds of surviving if you take five seconds to unbuckle your pack and throw its contents, including your stainless steel water bottle, to the ground, <coughs> then you might not understand what a pleasure it is to hike that same trail in October on a cool, dry day where the odds of a thunderstorm, while not impossible, are about 10,000 to one. After a snack and a long drink out of that same time-tested steel water bottle, the dogs and I make our way back down the trail, smelling not sulfur, but the slow rot of dying leaves in a dry climate and the occasional tang of pine pitch. An immature bald eagle rides a thermal down canyon, and it's windless enough that I can hear sun-warmed rocks newly freed from last night's frost, slip and settle in the big scree field across the creek that rises up toward Wasson Park. In the house I grew up in, fall marked the start of the most dangerous season. My mother dreaded the snow and ice and the perpetually gray skies of a mid-Atlantic winter. Either she never learned how to buy a serious winter coat or her vanity wouldn't allow it. She played indoor tennis, but the reservations were expensive and in high demand, so she didn't get enough exercise for her to justify the few food calories a day she normally ingested, and her perpetual hunger was the loudest thing in our house. The shortening days meant she drank more and started earlier, 
By the end of September, she was headed into a tailspin from which she would not emerge until the crocuses came up in the spring. By the time my mother died in 1993, the drug Prozac had been taken by more than 10 million people, and yet I don't believe the word depression had ever been uttered in my childhood home. Until once, during fall break of my junior year of college, I told my mother I had started taking advantage of Denison's free psychological services. A boy I had befriended from my geology classes was showing strong self-destructive tendencies. He had just left a severed pig's head in the ice machine in one of the all-female dorms, and I had made the appointment hoping to get advice on how I might help him. After giving the advice, the therapist a kind, smart, and soft-spoken man by the name of Jeff Pollard asked simply, and how are you feeling these days? I felt my body go utterly still for the count of one, two, three, and then I burst into sobs that lasted upwards of 10 minutes. I can still feel that office around me as if it were yesterday. The leather books, tall ceilings, and high windows, through which I could see all the trees on the quad ablaze in fall color. I can still feel my dawning understanding that therapy was a thing that had been invented to, among other applications, help people who had suffered exactly the sorts of things I had suffered at the hands of my father. Even then, it had taken many sessions for Dr. P to convince me that it was okay to accept that help. My mother and I were driving back from an unsuccessful trip to the mall. I had arrived at my parents' house wearing a peasant blouse and a long, colorful, hand-painted skirt I bought for more than I could afford at an art fair. She said the skirt made me look fat, and we'd go buy something she could stand to look at me in. I had fended off several pencil skirts and dark, heavy blouses, as well as a few items designed by Liz Claiborne. We hadn't exactly stopped speaking to each other, so after 10 minutes of car silence, I decided to tell her about Dr. P. He says I suffer from PTSD, which manifests in bouts of depression and low-level anxiety, but the good news is he doesn't think I'll need drugs. He thinks the talking will work. My mother kept her eyes on the road, but I saw the corner of her mouth twitch slightly. I wasn't sure about it at first, I said, but now each week I find myself looking forward to the hour I spend in his office I fiddled with my seatbelt. Dr. P says I'm learning to hear the sound of my own voice. Depression, huh? My mother said, louder than I expected. I've been hoping she'd ask me what the letters PTSD stood for. You know what we did for depression when I was your age? Drank, I managed not to say. <laughs> Drank. She said, <laughs> her eyes shooting to the car clock, confirming that we were, in fact, at least 30 minutes past cocktail hour. Back at the ranch, after our hike, I give a couple of hours to one of the larger fall projects, coating the exterior logs with UV protector. At 9,000 feet at this lat latitude, the UV eats through everything over the course of the summer. Paint plastic, enamel, and if I don't re-protect them every fall, the logs themselves. The instructions on the giant camera <coughs> line, it takes the coating 24 hours to seal correctly. And during that 24 hours, it must not encounter rain, dew, or temperatures below 40 degrees. It always gets below 40 degrees at the ranch at night, except sometimes in July during the monsoon. However bad cold is for the sealant, I feel certain half an inch of rain in 45 minutes would be worse. <laughs> if we're not in a drought year, it dews heavily every night until everything freezes solid. Given the impossibility of following the instructions on the can, I slap some coating on the logs in the heat of every afternoon and hope to get the whole house covered before the snow flies. The air at the ranch is thin, dry, and cold and the snowstorms get stuck in the dip and swirl of the basin, turning back and back again on themselves, sometimes dropping as much as four inches an hour. On any given morning from the 1st of October on out, I might wake to frozen ground in flurries. By dinner time, the split rail fences might have all gone under, and I might not see the tops of them again until March. That will be the day that launches four solid months of worry. 
for my elderly geldings, DeSeo and Roni, who get so stiff standing on that frozen moonscape with their achy old man legs they sometimes won't eat, won't even take the short walk to the water trough. For the mini donkeys, Simon and Isaac, who are far younger than the horses, but no taller than the split rail fences. In the biggest blizzards, they have to power through the pasture like Tonka trucks, leaving their belly marks in the fresh powder. I spend too many hours imagining them high centered and adrift somehow at night, their little legs spinning and spinning, but gaining no purchase at all. I worry about my Icelandic sheep, especially Jordan, my best to you who has a healthy lamb of her own each year and is always willing to nurse the orphans. She's prone to respiratory illness brought on by sudden cold snaps. I worry about my chickens who tend to attack and sometimes kill one another in extreme weather of any kind. What edges out the worry, of course, is the wonder. Because what could be better than 48 inches in 24 hours? 76 inches is the local record. Then a couple of Irish wolfhounds leaping through bottomless powder with giant smiles on their faces. Then a herd of 200 elk making their stately way chest deep in the snowbound pasture toward the river. Best of all, what accompanies each snowstorm is the knowledge that the aquifer is getting replenished, that summer wildfire fear is assuaged, if not abated, that the rivers will be full of trout and the pastures full of flowers come July. The autumn I was 25, I flew from graduate school in Utah to my parents' house in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, something I did with relative consistency up until my mother died. Downstairs in the TV room, my father and I were watching the Phillies get beat up by the Mets when the phone rang and my mother answered it upstairs. A few minutes later, we heard her banging around with some fervor. My father leaned toward me, said, go see what your mother's up to, will you? In her bedroom, she was packing a small suitcase. What's going on, I asked her. That was Jean, my mother said, without looking at me. Jean, as in your sister, I asked. In the quarter century I had been on the planet, I had maybe heard my mother say her sister's name five times. Yeah, she said. My father's dying in a hospital in Florida, and he says he wants to shake my hand. I looked at my mother for signs of fracture, but as she gathered her makeup into a little cloth case with red foxes printed on it, she seemed exactly as she had been before. If my mother had mentioned Jean five times in my life, it was five more times than she had talked about her father. The story I had been told was that on the very same day my mother's mother died in childbirth with my mother, her father abandoned the girls. Aunt Ermia and Uncle Marion, who had never wanted anything to do with children, agreed to raise them. Less than a year after my mother ran away to Broadway, Jean joined her as a way to get out of their sad and angry house. They had a sister act at first, and eventually went abroad with USO. Even though Jean was older, my mother had always been the wilder sister. When showbiz got too unruly for Jean, she returned to Spiceland, Indiana, found religion, and married her high school sweetheart. My mother had told me, but only once, that Jean never forgave my mother for corrupting her, for luring her to the big city, tarnishing her reputation, and ruining her life. The sisters stopped speaking when Jean returned to Indiana, and as far as my father or I knew, this was the first time Jean had made contact in more than four years. So what are you gonna do, I asked, though the suitcase was making the answer obvious. I'm going down there, she said. I've never laid eyes on the man, and this is apparently my last chance. You want me to go with you? Or drive you to the airport, I offered. Something about her matter-of-fact tone scaring me a little. No, no, stay here. Get your father to take you out to dinner. I won't be gone that long. The next day, at nearly the same hour, the Mets taking it to the Phillies once again, <laughs> my father and I heard the garage door open. My mother climbed the stairs without glancing in our direction, and my father indicated with his head. By the time I got to her room, she was already unpacking. How'd it go? I asked her, what happened? She looked at me as if I were crazy. What do you think happened? She said. I shook his hand. 
And with that, she turned back to her suitcase. I went downstairs to watch the ninth inning. A few minutes later, we heard her in the kitchen, starting dinner, humming one of her old torch songs, mixing herself a drink. I finished coding nearly the entire west side of the house with an hour to go before <coughs> sunset. If I extend my ladder fully and stand on the second step from the top, I can reach all but the four logs closest to the peak, and those logs are protected from the worst of the sun's rays by the roof's eaves anyway. Because I have not successfully taught William to dial 911, I leave it each year at that. Tomorrow I will get onto the roof with a coarse bristled round brush and a series of screw-in poles that allow me to sweep my chimney. I will force that brush from the top of the chimney all the way down into the basement and scrub for all I am worth for a good 20 minutes. Then I will climb down from the roof with my face and arms blackened by soot, relatively secure in the knowledge that if this turns out to be the winter that ends all winters, at least we will have begun it clean and creosote free. About six months and four cords of wood from now, there will be an April night so warm it will seem like overkill to build a fire. The next morning, I will open the windows to air out my bedroom and closet. I will hear the hum and whir of the automatic pump in the basement as it gets to work on the water that has inevitably seeped inside as 120 acres of snow turns to liquid and then tries to displace itself. I will trade my snowshoes for my extra tufts because almost overnight the pasture will have turned from mostly snow to mostly muck. As I zigzag across it trying to stay out of the deepest mud, I will spot a flash of blue so simultaneously bright and deep it won't quite make sense in this late winter color scheme of bare branches, dusky clouds, and dirty ice. The Rocky Mountain bluebirds will arrive, only the males at first scouting my pasture for a nesting place. I'll watch the bluebirds flip along the fence line, hear the warble high and clear, and I'll know the 35 below zero nights are over, that there will be one more big dump of snow so heavy the horses will go on a water strike rather than slog through it to the trough, but it will melt in a matter of days. And before too long, there will be tiny buds on the aspen trees, the ice-choked river will run free again, and a green so subtle I think I might be imagining it will tint first the yard, then the pasture. The horses' spines will relax all the way to their tails. The chickens will venture out of the coop, and even the coyotes' barks will seem lazier, a little less hungry, a little less lonely. The wild iris will push up through the soil, and the roan, whose winter coat is burgundy wine, will shed out to a bright, barely speckled gray. In a matter of weeks, the paint-by-number landscape will have filled in around that first flash of blue, pale green aspen leaf, crimson paintbrush, purple lupin, red-tailed hawk. A few days after we talked about depression, my mother came into my room while I was sleeping, took the hand-painted skirt out of my closet, washed it in hot water, took the waistband in, and then returned it without a word. When I went to put it on for my return flight, all of the beautiful colors were <coughs> muted, and it was a length that had never been and would never be in style. I put my jeans back on and stuck my head in her bedroom with the skirt in my hand. Why can't you like me the way I am? I leaned against the door jam, trying to look calm. There were rules against such questions in my household and I knew it. Is that the kind of thing they teach you to say in therapy, she said. I guess maybe it is, I said. Her eyes were focused as usual on herself in her makeup mirror. I gave up everything I loved for you, she said, for maybe the 500th millionth time. I'm sorry, I said. And I was. There were so many things that made my mother sad. The weather, my wardrobe, the choices she made, most notably, it turned out, having me. I want to write here that I understand, that I know she did her best. 
that there was no one in her early life to teach her how to love, how to take responsibility, how to be something other than a victim of the circumstances life dealt her. And as I write the words, I can see that they are true. But the other thing I need to say is this. For all of my childhood and throughout my teens, I prayed to have myself sucked right back up into the ether because I thought it might give my mother back her hopes and dreams and joy. But the universe wouldn't make that trade with me. And so my mother died, drunk and unhappy. And I found my way to this ranch, this place where I protect and I'm protected by animals. This place where nature controls how I spend my days and how I spend my life. This place where I can love every season. When the sun sets tonight, the temperature will drop in 30 minutes from 55 to 38. They're calling for a cold front to move through the valley and if they're right, tonight we'll get our first truly hard frost. I've got a pot of green chili stew on simmer, and the dogs are snoring by the wood stove. There's nothing I would trade this for. Now, let it snow.